this talk of the day. I will be talking about uh, diagnostics, uh, how you check that what is occurring in your instrument, in your guide, uh, and in your system, and how you exploit that you're doing a simulation and not a real measurement. This uh, can help you optimize your instrument without even using numerical optimization because you can understand what's going on to a larger degree. So, first an overview. The first and easiest way to understand what's going on inside your instrument is to just place monitors everywhere. So I'll talk about this strategy. But there are also some more complex ways of doing it that is the main motivation for this talk. First, the combination of when and extend keywords, as we've talked about before and that we've seen in some examples. Then there's monitor NV, the Swiss Army knife that has a pre-monitor NV that can actually help you look for correlations. And then there are these scatter logger components written by Eric that can uh, give you more insight to what's going on in guide systems. So first, on using monitors everywhere in the instrument. It can quickly become overwhelming to look at, but remember that this is a very basic advantage of simulation, and that you should exploit this advantage by placing these monitors between your guides and understanding where do you lose beam, where do you uh, not need as large or as small a guide. Um, <coughs> you have the possibility of looking into this. Of course, this is a bit obvious after a full week of training, but I felt that I needed to remind you that, that this is um, the easiest way to do diagnostics. Now, the extend and when is, uh, is useful for sorting combined data into different boxes. For example, if you have some output from an experiment, a virtual experiment, you can split it into signal and background based on some arbitrary information about the neutron, where it's scattered earlier or something like that. And the way you do it is that you declare some variable, for example, the number of scattering events. Then in your assembly component, you use a, an extend section to set this value to some value that is internal to the component. And so you might need to understand something about the code of the component in order to extract the correct information. You just open up the component file and try to figure out what's going on. All this most often some help about the possible parameters that you could wish to extract in the, in the header section of the code. Then it's just a matter of using this information when you put a monitor and use the web condition here. This PSD just sees first order and this PSD only sees more than one order scatter. Let's see an example of what this could look like. This is from the Max instrument I presented on Wednesday. Here we have the full simulated signal, the black curve. The red one is the measured signal and is normalized to the black intensity. The yellow one is what we get from the sample. So we, we get most of our intensity here. There's a lot of, I believe it's uh, sodium that has a very high incoherent scattering cross section. But we can also see that this, the contributions from the sample environment, uh, the inner and outer, prior to that and how this sort of matches the shape of some of the background issues. So you can always decompose your simulated data, you can never decompose your real data. Now for monitor NV and pre-monitor NV. What happens is that you can save the state of the neutron at some point in your instrument and then view it later how, but then you, you get the previous state, but only if it made it to this um, component later down the line. So you could, for example, set the pre-monitor at the moderator, and 
the actual modular MD at the sanding position, and then you would get the origin points at the moderator only for the neutrons that go all the way to the sample. This is extremely useful for exploring correlations at different places in the instrument. It requires that you set this option use pre monitor, and it requires that you name the, the simply the name of the monitor MD component that you wish to use at a later time. So I made a small example, I actually took the one from Tuesday that uh, we used as an exercise, while well, we just have a source, a guide, a monochromator with five blades of vertical focusing, and then a sample. And here, these are the positions on the moderator where the neutrons that hit the sample came from. And it's, it's a little hard to see, but there are some weird correlations with lower intensity between some lines. And I think that's corresponding to different reflections in the guide that can still reach the monochromator and hit the sample. So this is where we put the pre-monitor, this is where we put the minus ND. And then another plot I made was looking at the position on the moderator and the wavelength that was accepted by the monochromator. Of course, if you are right from the center of the source, you can go straight to the monochromator and hit the sample, and that is the desired wavelength. But you, if you are in one of the sides, you need to have uh, either a little bit higher or a little bit lower divergence, uh, and then you will hit the guide first, or maybe the other side, then hit the monochromator. But then you will only be reflected if your wavelength is a little different from what we selected. And then we get this weird cross correlation. <coughs> and this is something that you could have figured out with pen and paper, but you probably would never notice it. But if you just put in these once in a while to check for these kinds of correlations, you will gain new understanding of the instruments you're building. Then there are the scatter logger components. And they, they take a little bit of setup to get working correctly. There are four components that need to work together in order for this to function. And the way you do it, if we just have a source, a guide, and some sample data dump, you first start by putting the scatter logger before the region you wish to investigate, and then you put a scatter logger stop component afterwards. So now we're just investigating what's going on in the guide. Then we need to place an arm and then this scatter logger iterator. After that one, we can place as many of these monitor MDs that set up in a special way to record information on every scattering event that happened in the guide. And then we need to tell it to stop and have a last arm that will jump back to the first arm in case there are many scatterings in the guide, each of them can be added to the monitor. So I will always use the examples provided with MaxFast in order to set this up. So take a, a direct copy. And also notice that we found some bugs in this example yesterday. So take the newest version from GitHub in order for, to make sure that everything works correctly. So first, yeah. in, in fact, the files are all loaded on the video in GitHub as well. So you don't have to dig for them in the next Yeah. Okay. So they're there for uh, today's uh, school GitHub too. Oh, uh, let's do a really quick trick here. But first example of the data from such a scatter logger is the um, intensity lost. So this is the intensity that leaves the guide uh, at a certain point in the guide. And this is a, a 10 meter long straight guide. And we use most neutrons at the start. It's probably because they have a very high divergence or way too low wavelength to be even reflected. 
So they, they go out through the guides. And we probably need more shielding in that part. As we go further along the guide, the losses uh, stabilize. They don't go to a zero because there's always a, a risk of some reflection killing the neutron at the reflectivity curve. So very useful to know and help you set up the correct shielding. Here we look at the, the losses as a function of wavelength and distance. And we can see a lot of uh, pretty correlations. And I was actually really surprised to see so many details in this plot because it's just a straight guide, a source, and nothing more. Of course, you're most likely to be lost at the start of the guide. You already knew that. And basically for all wavelengths, you might have just way too high a divergence to be reflected. Then later on, there's some correlations appearing that, of course, the higher the wavelength, the lower the risk of being lost. And also, even at the low wavelength, we lose less as time goes upon because they didn't make it that far. And then the last monitor to show from the straight guide uh, in terms of losses is the losses as a function of both wavelength and total divergence. If you have no divergence whatsoever at zero, you will make it through because you won't even hit the walls. If you have some small divergence, you will probably be lost if your wavelength is very low, but you basically have a really high chance of making it through if your wavelength is high enough. And there's some connection between divergence and wavelength determined by the geometry and the reflectivity function. And you can understand this from this figure. Now it's time to look at the neutrons that are actually <coughs> scattered in the, or at least attempt to scatter in the guide. This is a figure of, again, the distance in the guide, and then the required M value for this neutron to actually be reflected at this position. And again, at the very start of the guide, most of the neutrons will need a really high M value, probably also in excess of 10 to be scattered if they have a like, 10 degree angle. But since it's only an M equals 3 guide, most of these die out. And our intensity is located below M equals 3. And we can also see how, uh, where we could perhaps save some money in M value. If you wanted a very narrow wavelength band, apparently you could just save an M value in these small areas which is very surprising. We can also select different orders of scattering. So these are only the first scattering we see from the start. These are then the second scattering. And of course that happens further into the guide. The third scattering and the fourth. And we can understand where this is likely to happen, which M values are required. I wanted to try something a little more interesting than just a straight guide, because the geometry is almost trivial. Here we have an elliptical guide, and we get some strange output. We can still try to understand this. The, I think the most important part to realize is that when the width of the guide increases, in a, in a continuous nice way, the divergence of the beam decreases and the footprint increases. And that actually means that the reflections with the side of the guide happen with a lower angle and we can save some money on M value. So even though this has M equals 3 everywhere, we could just have M equals 1.5 in the middle. Actually, this is a 50 meter guide and we could have it in the middle 40 meters of the guide, we will have a lower M value. And this 
is one of the reasons that the elliptic guide can be very efficient at transporting over long distances because all the reflections in the middle happen at very low angles. We can also view this uh, as a function of scattering order. Of course, the first order can happen at, at the very start of the guide and at basically any angle. But this will transform the neutrons to a lower angle because the slope is positive. Now the next reflection is much more commonly in the low end region because of this lower divergence. And we see the third reflection, even though it can happen very early or after 10 meters, it's now below any question. And here's the, the fourth uh, reflection, which can happen over a huge range of distances. And again, we need a high end value at the very end, because now the walls contract and they add divergence to the ray. And this requires a high end value, and we'll then have a focused beam with high divergence at the end, but not necessarily hitting a single point. And just for easy comparison, here is the 10 meter straight guide and the 50 meter elliptic guide required in value as a function of distance. And they, they both of them have these funny features that we have yet to fully understand. And this is probably because we haven't done this very long. It's not a component that used very frequently. But as we can see here, it provides a lot of insight. So I really recommend that you do. So, final remarks, remember that the main advantage of simulations is that you can probe what's going on and further your understanding. So use these diagnostic tools to understand what's going on and from that make better instruments that cost less. Those things can actually be achieved at once, which is remarkable only from your understanding. And then, as this is my last talk of the week, I wish to say thank you for listening to me talking for so long. Uh, and it's been a joy to be here at CSNS and help all of you.